I, uh, there's really no way to explain on radio just how dark it is out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night with no stars, no moon, no cultural lighting. And it's your job to land a high performance aircraft on an aircraft carrier. Here, let me have my guest take a stab at it. Although, as you'll find out in a few moments, these are not his words. And looking back over everything that I've done in the Navy and in the space program, absolutely nothing matched night carrier aviation. It's more difficult than any of the other things I did, including landing on the moon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat. My name is Vincent Aiello. I am your host, and this is episode 15. We're talking night carrier landings. So I hope you'll forgive me for the little melodramatic intro there, but man, it really is dark and scary out there. Now, to be fair, sometimes there is a moon and sometimes the stars are out, but when it's overcast, it's just dark. I don't know how else to explain it, and it's scary, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. First off, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the show. If you're just joining us, you'll definitely want to go back and listen to the beginning of this aircraft carrier series. It starts back in episode 11, where we look at the carrier itself in a couple episodes. Then we talk day landings in a couple, and now we're going to wrap it up with night landings. Now, before we get to the listener questions, I want to tell you about a couple air shows coming up. First is the one I mentioned on the last episode, and that is the PAX Air Expo at Patuxent River Naval Air Station in Maryland. And that is the weekend of June 3rd, 2nd and 3rd, and it's going to feature the Blue Angels. So if you live in the Washington, D.C. area or you'll be visiting there, you should go check out that show. And the weekend after that, for those of you in the Niagara Falls, New York area, the Thunder of Niagara will be featuring the Thunderbirds, and that will be held at the Niagara Falls Air Reserve Station. So you should go check that one out, too, if you're in that area. Now, on that note, a couple reasons why I like to recommend air shows. Number one, that is how I got my start when I was about seven years old. My parents took me to air shows. And number two, to be fair, is I've reached out to air shows in an effort to help promote this show. And so we help each other out. If you go to one of those shows, you'll see an ad for this podcast in their program. And I help them to get more folks to go out and check out the show. But even so, you should definitely go take a look because a day at an air show is always a fun time. There's amazing performers, good eats, good things to see, and it's just a great time all around. All right, let's get to the listener questions. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit differently, I think, going forward. And that is, many of you have written with really fantastic questions, thank you, uh, but in multiple parts. And then sometimes the different parts are on different topics. So what I'm going to do now is if the topic changes, I'm going to answer your first question. And then I will go on to the next person. And then by the time we get to the end, I'll come back around to whatever your next question is, if it's on a different subject. That way, everybody has a chance to get their question thrown in the ring. And this week, we will start with Steve from Toronto, Canada, who asks, what survival kit is in the seat pan? How long does it last? Skewed mostly to water survival or a general kit for land and sea? Well, great question, Steve. In the FA-18, in the seat pan that we carry with us when we eject out of the aircraft, there is a raft that you will land in. And so, yes, that part, well, you don't land in it, but once you get in the water, you'll get in your raft. So that is, of course, decidedly for the sea survival. But there's also an emergency oxygen bottle for you to breathe on your way down if your mask is still attached to your face. And then inside, yes, there are some survival items, drinking water, uh, knife, flares, food, a little bit of food, some sea dye, some sunscreen, a fire starting kit. So that one's obviously not for sea so much. And then a whistle and a mirror and a few other things. Now, interestingly, in the F-18, we carry some of the stuff 
on our chest in the survival vest that we talked about in episode three. But in the F-16, when I had a chance to fly that, at least the gear we wore in the Navy, there was a lot less gear that we wore on us. And so there was a lot more survival gear in the seat pan, including the radio and a few other things. So it does vary. I can't speak to any of the other fighters, but that is the uh, F-18 specifically. All right, James from Australia asks, in your refueling episode, you mentioned planes receive fuel midair by weight measure, not a volume measure like we do at the petrol pump. Anyway, he asks, why is that? Well, James, uh, we also measure fuel by weight on the ground, not just in midair. And that is because fuel, like pretty much any liquid or really any substance, it will change volume with changes in temperature, but it does not change weight. And so you may have an aircraft that is taking off in very hot temperatures, but 30,000 feet above the ground, it could be 100 degrees Celsius lower than what it was on the ground. And so that fuel is going to cool and the volume will change, but the weight does not. So they figured this out a long time ago and it just makes more sense to measure by weight. In your car, at the petrol pump, when you drive off, even if you drove from a low desert to a high mountaintop, it's really not gonna change that much on that one tank of gas. So they can afford to do it by volume in that example. All right, next up, let's take a phone call. Hi, Vincent. This is David in Augusta, Georgia. What was your favorite platform to tank from? And what was the procedure if the basket broke off and got hung up on your probe? Would you still trap aboard ship or would you divert to a land base? Thanks a lot. Good question, David. You know, I'm looking back in my mind's eye here on all the aircraft I've tanked off, and let me see if I can rattle some off. C-130, S-3, F-18, KC-135, KC-10, British Nimrod, might be missing, oh yeah, Omega, a commercial tanker, and I might be missing some others, but I would say my favorite was probably the KC-10, because it was faster than, say, a C-130, which made it a little easier to manipulate the controls. It was not as loud as an F-18, and it was not as difficult to get in. Actually, it was more difficult to get in than a KC-135, but it was a little easier to stay in once you were in and receive your fuel. So probably the KC-10. Now, to your second part, if the basket breaks off due to some form of error, whether it's on you or the basket itself, then it depends. And I'm, again, regretful of using that answer, but it really does. If you're off the coast of Southern California, you're probably just going to go back and land at the base. If you are somewhere in the middle of the ocean, of course, you have no choice. And if you're somewhere neutral, but you know there's a field nearby that you could use, but it's in other countries, and it's maybe just easier to bring you aboard, then they typically would. And I never was on a ship where this happened. But in hearing stories, what they would do is they would just clear what's called the foul lines, which are the lines just outside of where aircraft land. So that if this thing came flying off on the trap, then everybody would be clear. So they would just bring you aboard. You'd try to fly it the best you could without it distracting you too much. And if it came whipping off, well, if it came to a stop, they'd grab it and hang it over the chair in your ready room. <laughs> or if it went off the edge, then it was gone anyway. So, all right, good question. All right, let's move on to Jeff from Nashville, Tennessee, who asks, at high speeds, does the wind moving over the canopy create an additional environmental noise in the cockpit? And same for aircraft outside in formation as well. Yes, Jeff, the F-18 had what was affectionately called the Hornet hum. At about 480 knots, you just get this resonance or noise. I don't know, really know what it was, but it definitely had a little bit more of a growl to it that just sounded cool even from inside the cockpit. I don't remember really hearing it off of other aircraft when you were flying next to them because if you were going the same speed, which you would have to be in formation, then you would just hear it off of your own. But yeah, coming in the break, usually you knew, you know, if you were allowed to go a little faster than the normal 350, that if you started to hear the Hornet hum, then you knew you're up around the 480 knots mark. And that was always pretty cool. All right, Mike Mark from Montreal, Quebec asks, from your experience, how much is discussed or taught about John Boyd and his concepts and theories, including aerial attack study, energy maneuverability, OODA loop cycles, etc.? How much credit is given to him? Thanks for your question, Mike Mark. You know, I honestly did not know that much about John Boyd for most of my career until a friend of mine sent me his book out on deployment, and I read it and really loved it. And 
I used one of his quotes, well, the author's quotes uh, of that book written about John Boyd in my retirement speech a little over a year ago. So tremendous man, really had an amazing influence on a lot of important aircraft like the A-10, the F-16, the F-15, et cetera. But we had used his EM or energy maneuverability diagrams in Top Gun, and I didn't even know they were his. So to answer your question, not much credit, frankly. Uh, but for everyone else, just real quickly, essentially what you do is you take two airplanes, let's say an F-16 and a MiG-29, and you assume they both have 50% fuel. They're at 15,000 feet, and they are carrying a certain loadout, which is written right there in the fine print. And what you do is you overlay the performance of each of them so that you can come up with a game plan if you're, let's say, the F-16 pilot, to say that, oh, look, I have a better turn rate Rate, meaning I turn more degrees per second than him, but he has a better turn radius, meaning he is radius of circle in the turn is smaller. And those are just two arbitrary examples that may or may not be true. And what it does is it allows you to look at the different altitudes and configurations and airspeeds and come up with a game plan so that if you ever meet one in combat, you can figure out what is going to be the best tactic. But again, I never knew that was John Boyd's. And as far as the OODA loop, which, gosh, I should have probably looked up, observe, orient, Oh dear, I don't know. There's something else in there, and I'll probably go back and edit this out. But anyway, it's you know, it's fairly well known by most people, and it is, uh, it's it's something we I think do in certain circles. But truthfully, it's not something I seriously considered in a lot of our day-to-day -day operations, and never knew it was John Boyd's until I read the book. All right, I think that is going to be all we have time for for questions this week. I want to jump right into our interview with Lieutenant Commander Trey Kalish, call sign Fish. He's a friend of mine from Japan. I'll here in a moment. And as I talked about at the very top of the episode, I mean, we're going to talk about night traps. And we might not spend very much time talking about the actual ball flying because it's not that different than what we talked about on the previous episode with Farva, except that it's dark and you just have to keep doing meatball lineup angle of attack but you don't have the peripheral vision, and we will certainly uh, touch on that here in this interview. Also, he does mention the words, or letters, O-I-F, and that made sense to me at the time, and I didn't think to explain it, but you probably maybe also know that as Operation Iraqi Freedom, which ended eh, a few years back now, but that was, some people call it Desert Storm 2, but from 2003 till about 2009, I want to say 10 or 12. And there's a lot of other terms that we throw out in this one. We will do our best to explain them as we go. And you will find them on the glossary tab of the website. So you can always go look at that. It's a repository for different terms and jargon we use in fighter aviation. And so it's kind of fun writing those in there. And if you have any feedback, please let me know because I haven't heard much about it yet. All right, with that, let's talk about those scary night traps. All right, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are joined by Lieutenant Commander Trey Kalish, call sign Fish. Fish, welcome to the show, bud. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're going to talk about night carrier landings. So you've heard Farva's yes. episodes? Yeah, listen to Farva's. Okay, so you know, obviously you knew all that stuff, but mm -hmm. now you know what he talked about. Yes. So we're going to pick it up today with a discussion on night stuff, and we'll throw in a few other things. But before we do, give us a quick summary of where you are, where you've been, how you came to be, sure. who and what you are. Sure, we will do. Um, I grew up in the Navy. Um, my dad was a C-2 pilot. Uh, we lived in Siganella, Sicily for three years of my life there as a young boy. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away in an aircraft accident, not in the Navy. And my mom remarried an F-14 Rio. So I always wanted to fly, and uh, I wanted to fly carrier aviation. Uh, my stepdad also went to the Naval Academy. My, my dad didn't, so I went to the Naval Academy. Cool. A great experience. Coming out of flight school, though, um, I, I did not get the pointy nose. I got S3s. Really? And um, probably one of the best things that ever happened to me okay. because I never would have known San Diego for what it is if that had not happened. And uh, I did get a Super Hornet transition because all the S3s went away. And I got to fly. Uh, I went through the Rag and Lemoore. Uh, so my wife and I got to experience that and knew we never wanted to do it again. <laughs> and um, we went to Japan. We decided to just keep going west from Jacksonville. For my department head tour, I was an instructor in Kingsville. And I will say, flying the F-18 was awesome. I would love to fly it again. Flying the T-45 was amazing because I was teaching students, and I was flying basic fighter maneuvers. That was all I did two to three times a day that must for have been pretty cool. two years. <laughs> Or we'd go to El Centro and drop bombs right. or do low levels. So that brought me here to San Diego. When I was done with that, they, um, a weird transition uh, into the amphibious community doing air command and control. 
Uh, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, though, and that was we wanted to stay here in San Diego. So I uh, sought a set of follow-on orders here in San Diego that would uh, keep me on the amphibious base and here in Coronado, which ain't too shabby. And um, so that's where I am now. And, and I'm an instructor in expeditionary warfare, teaching guys about air command and control. Dude, I could have you back on all kinds of different episodes because I can't tell you how many questions I get from young people who want to be fighter pilots. And they want an episode on flight school and how to best prepare themselves. So we can almost do one of those. Plus the uh, close air support forward air controller. That Those terms have come up a few times on this show. I could give you a lot of lessons on what not to do in flight school. <laughs> Well, you're not our first S3 guest. Our very first episode with Sunshine, who just came back on a Facebook Live question and answer segment, was an S3 guy. Do you know Brian Sinclair? It sounds familiar. If I saw his face, I'm sure I'd recognize him. Oh, yeah. Him. Well, you'd see it with a smile because the dude's just as happy as can be. But anyway, he was an S3 guy as well. So it was your JO tour in Japan. That's when we met, right? Because I was the it was, air yes. wing operations officer out there. Okay. Right. And during that tour, you were a landing signal officer. Is that correct? Yes, I was. Okay. So you have the credibility to talk about what we're going to cover here today. Did you do any waving at the RAG, as you call it, or the FRS? I did not. So in the transition from S3s to F-18s, I did not get an opportunity to be an instructor in the S3 or the F-18. I went straight into a transition, then back out into the operational fleet. I did get, you know, what we call a a wing qual, so I had the highest qualification you could have as an LSO. Fortunately, though, and all that, I got some really great waving experience. I got to wave the two last Tomcat squadrons in the Navy on their last deployment. Of course, I got to wave S3s. I was still on the carrier when you had a bunch of different aircraft, not just all Super Hornets. Right. And then I got really fortunate when I went to Japan. They needed another LSO. Typically, that wouldn't happen where I would keep waving, but they needed an LSO. They didn't have somebody. I was already trained up, so I got to wave again, and it was awesome. I did it for about a year. Very cool. Yeah, Farva talked about the different quals and the wing qual on the previous episode, so I think oh, right. listeners are hopefully familiar with that. Excellent. Well, we are going to tap into that knowledge of yours. And I don't, When was your last night trap, by the way? For me, it was 2009. <laughs> Which was you in were, Japan. When that's we right. Were, that's right. So yeah. you were, you're not far off from me. Mine was okay. in September of 2010. Okay. Well, hopefully we still have the credibility, and I know we both did a little research to remind ourselves here. So anyway, let's set the stage. And again, anyone who's listening to this who hasn't listened to episodes 13 and 14 should probably go back and check that out first, because we talk there about the equipment and the procedures and you know the case one and the case two. But today, I want to touch on the case three, which we can also do in the daytime if the weather's poor enough. Mm -hmm. But let's start with that. And then let's just kind of follow it chronologically from when we, let's say, check in with Marshall. We don't have to necessarily talk about all the comms side of it, unless it comes to your mind. And I'm sure people will find that interesting. But let's talk about where we hold and how we commence and then what happens all the way down the chute. And then if we have some time, maybe we can even talk a little bit more about flying the ball, because I get a lot of questions on that. I think Farva touched on it a little, but of course, when you turn the lights off, it's a whole different animal. And I don't don't know about you, and I don't miss it. (laughs) Not one bit. (laughs) But um, let's let's say the two of us are out flying in separate aircraft, and we finish our night mission, whether it's, let's just say we're doing intercepts air to air, pretty benign usually. And if you're the lead of me, you're going to probably do one or two final checks and you're going to say, all right, dude, see you later. And I'm going to go off on my own and you're going to go off on your own. So what's the first thing you're going to do at that point when it's, let's say, 15 minutes prior to recovery, but you know, you don't have much fuel to go do anything else really. Well, before I get into that, I just want to share a quote that I found uh, from uh, Captain Pete Conrad. If uh, anybody's a space buff, you would know him as being one of the Gemini astronauts so right after the Mercury 7. So he was one of our pioneers in space. Well, he said he was a naval aviator, and he said, in looking back over everything that I've done in the Navy and in the space program, I think absolutely nothing matched night carrier aviation. I still think that separates the men from the boys. It's more difficult than any of the other things I did, including landing on the moon. Wow. So if that puts it into perspective... With that as a preface, let's, uh, right. let's so, jump right into so it. So here we go. So I've just kissed my wingman off after checking in with Strike, and now we're checking in with Marshall. And I'll check in with Marshall and tell them I'm 102. That's at, your side number. That's my side number. So 102 on the 250 Angels 15, 
5.8 or 7.5, something like that. So what I just said there was I'm on the 250 radio for 42 miles, and I'm at Angels 15, which is my altitude, 15,000 feet. And my state is how much fuel I have in thousands of pounds. So 5.5 would be 5,500 pounds or 7.5, 7,500 pounds. And then Marshall would assign me a place to hold. And who is Marshall, real quick? So Marshall, they're basically the guys that are taking us in as we come back into the, the carrier control area, and uh, they're going to queue us. We're okay. gonna we're gonna go wait in line to take our turn to land on the carrier. So if anyone does civilian flying, is it a little bit like approach control? Yeah, not quite approach control. It's um, so they don't have anything like it in the civilian flying. Okay. That's specifically Marshall. Their job is just to tell you to go wait. Right. <laughs> approach, I guess, in that example is a. And at least in the case of the United States, an FAA entity in air traffic control. And they're just kind of providing a service. But on the ship, Marshall's part of the team. And we're all yes. part of this big team. And so they're going to ask you for your fuel state. And they're going to be directive necessarily. They're not just going to take your requests. And we're all going to work together here to make this happen. So anyway. Right. Yeah, certainly. Didn't mean to belittle what Marshall does. They have a big job. They've got to keep aircraft separated. And so they are, yeah, they are very sure. much like a No, I wasn't trying to point that Absolutely. out. Absolutely. So you check in with everything you just said, and then they're going to give you what, some Marshall instructions? Yeah, certainly. And and, um, and so nor- actually the way it would happen is I'd check in with my wingman and uh, I'd tell them his sign number as well and his state, and then they would assign us two different holding points. Now, those holding points are going to be in the same, I guess, a two-dimensional piece of sky, but they're going to separate us by altitude and about 1,000 feet. And then what they're going to do is they're going to take the guy who has less fuel and they're going to put him at the lower altitude. And the reason they do that is because he's going to come down first. So they'll, they'll assign us a point that's behind the carrier from where they expect the carrier to be driving, the direction it's supposed to be going, what they call BRC, Base Recovery Course. Uh, so, so then they'll uh, give us martial instructions, and we will then uh, proceed to the position they told us to go to in the altitude, and then report established, and then wait our turn and our expected recovery time. Okay, so let's stick with your previous example. You said, I think, you were on the 260 radial. So if anyone can imagine just a a compass rose planted on top of the ship, that's just 10 degrees off of of due west. And so let's say the ship is steaming due east. And for simplicity, we'll just say that the Marshall stack is going to be right behind them. So they might send you then over to the 270, right? So we're going to have this giant stack, if you will, behind the ship off to the west in this example. Yeah, exactly. And, and what they'll do is they'll start stacking aircraft up at about 6,000 feet. And the rule that they use is they'll take the altitude that you're holding at, you add 15 to that, and that's how far behind the ship you're supposed to hold. So if you're holding at Angel 6 or 6,000 feet, then you're supposed to hold at 21 miles on that 270 radial behind the ship. Okay, so if I'm with you in that example, and I was wrong earlier about kissing me off early, but you're right. We would come in together. Let's say I'm lower state, and I'm, I forget what you said you were, but I'm a different side number, so maybe I'm 110. They're going to give me my Marshall instructions, and suppose they give me Marshall 270-21, Angel 6. They're probably going to give you, if you're the next guy down, what, 270? Angel 7. At 22. At 22. Okay. Exactly. So everyone is at their altitude plus 15, but nobody's at the same altitude necessarily. Exactly. And, and if for whatever reason you had to hold guys at the same altitude because of weather, and it does happen, what they'll do is they'll have two different martial radials. And I've seen that happen before. And that's okay. um, not cool, but it's what you got to do sometimes. So you might, in this example, have instead of one at 270, you might have one at 240 and one at 300. Exactly. Okay. Keep, it, like, keep that All good right. separation between the aircraft. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so while you're in the, um, you find yourself in the Marshall stack, you hit your expected approach time, and they should confirm that with you. What you'll do is you've got to set up your timing so you hit that time, so that you are commencing your approach at the right distance from the ship at the time they told you to. And it's because the whole thing is a dance, just like Farva talked about with case one. It's a dance coming in. You, you, you need to sequence yourself in behind the aircraft ahead of you. And you have to make sure you're responsible for that timing. So you uh, use pilot lingo. Um, we call half standard rate turns. So you use the timing of the turn. It takes you two minutes to make 180 degrees of turn. So you factor that in. You go ahead and set up how far away you want to drive from the ship so that you have the right amount of time that you're driving in towards the ship. So there's, there's math going on in the cockpit. you got to make sure that you're hitting your point on time because if you don't, you're going to mess up the guy behind you. All right. So let's say, like right now, it's time 5-9. So if I checked in at 6,000, they gave me a push time of 04. What you're saying is I need to be at the 270 radial at 21 miles at 6,000 feet heading 090 
at exactly time zero four. That's exactly it. Okay. And so you might then have a push time, what, a minute behind me? It's typically two minutes. They want two minutes of separation at night. Now, again, we're not just flying around willy-nilly. We're holding fairly close to where we should be. We're just making orbits, left-hand turns generally. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, I mentioned earlier the half-standard rate turn. Um, in, uh, when you're talking uh, flying in instrument conditions and uh, you're not yanking and banking, you, you have standard rate turns, half-standard rate turns, and, and these exist because it's all about timing. Half right. standard rate turn is going to give you a certain amount of turn and a certain amount of time. So you will you have the opportunity to do the math on, in your head or on your kneeboard card and figure out how many turns do I have to do and what kind of legs. Like if, uh, if you're holding at 250 knots or you're 6,000 feet, you're really doing about 300 knots. And so you know you're going five miles a minute. So if you have, in this case, five minutes until you need to push, so you know you've got two turns for four minutes, So that means you really only want to go outbound for about 20 seconds, not 30 seconds, because the ship's driving away from you. So you got to take that into account, too. (laughs) If you go outbound for 30 seconds, you're going to be late. You make that first turn. It takes you two minutes to turn away from the ship. Now it takes you another 20 seconds as you go away. You start your next turn inbound. It takes you another two minutes. And now you should only have about 30 seconds till your push time. You should be about 30 seconds away from your push point if you did it right. If we have listeners who don't like numbers, they might be throwing up right now. But, uh, <laughs> ho- hopefully not, but this is what pilots have to deal with. So, Fish, I don't know about you. What I used to do, I'll tell you, is I would hold a minute away from the point. So if we were using 21 miles, I would hold, like you said, about 25, 26 miles. Mm-hmm. And then I would just do turns out there. So in my example, if I knew I needed to push at 04, I would say, okay, I want to be at 26 miles at 03. And so as I was holding, I would just keep manipulating my turns. And so... I would try to be there at five, nine. Mm -hmm. And then I would say to myself, oh, I have a four minute turn and every 90 degrees of turn, I'm going to check to make sure I'm exactly on time. So that as I roll out of this thing, instead of being right at my push point, I still have a minute to make it up in case I screw it up. And a lot of times I did. So I could either speed up or slow down. (laughs) But the idea was, this was, we'd rib each other later. If you didn't call commencing... (laughs) At exactly the right time, boy, you would hear about it from people. So it's it's a market. You'd be five miles away, and you'd say, commencing. "Oh, that's true too." But ideally, you'd be exactly where you were supposed to be. Yeah. So anyway, it's just games we play. But the point being is, you work your timing. You arrive at the particular point in space on time, mm-hmm. and then what do you do from there? So once you hit your point, so you uh, so in this case I'm at six thousand feet. I'm heading inbound on the zero nine zero. So I'm going to make sure I'm 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 both of those, and I am at twenty one DME. We call it twenty one miles from the ship at time zero four. We said mm-hmm. uh, at that point I'm going to pull my power, not quite all the way to idle. Pull out my speed brakes and lower the nose so that I I attain a 4,000 foot per minute rate of descent. And I'm going to come up with a radio and say 102 commencing 7.2 right. um, in a Super Hornet. And did we also say the altimeter? It's been a little while. Did we used to? Uh, and we would, yes, we would read back the that's altimeter. Right. You'd always read back the altimeter because uh, that's you know kind of important the, when you get to the bottom. Right. You know you're at the right altitude. Right. All right. So you're, you're coming downhill. Your throttles are back. Your speed brakes are open. And of course, we started this scenario at six, but a lot of times the fighters will be up around eight or nine or 10. So you have a little more time to come down. Right. But then at one point, we're going to shallow out the rate of descent. Yeah, so once you hit, um, we call it platform. You hit 5,000 feet, and the reason we, we the reason we use uh, 5,000 feet as a number is because that's where our rad outs become active. Um, so our rad, our radar altimeter. And so you get this uh, uh, radar frequency bouncing off the water or off the ground, and it tells you exactly how high you are. It's uh, more accurate for your above ground level um, than just using a, a barometric altimeter. So once you hit 5,000 feet, that's when your rad out will go off. You check to make sure it goes off. So you got to listen for the beep. If it doesn't go off, now you know you've got a bad rad out or maybe you didn't set it to 5,000 feet during the flight, which, you know, so that's a learning point. Bring that back to the debrief. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, um, uh, also, that can be an indicator. When that has happened to me, and I won't pretend it hasn't, I use that as a, uh-oh, I'm behind. Yes. There's something going on with me that I'm missing something, so I need to make sure I refocus on everything else. But anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, another one of those things that you're doing on that, um, and maybe at that point, once you've hit platform, is you're checking your state. Because you can only, as Farva mentioned, you can only be so heavy um, when you get down to the make the arrestment. And so you start thinking about your state, and you're like, okay, how much gas am I going to have when I hit 10 miles and I start to dirty up? Because if you haven't dumped the gas by then, that's your last chance. 
So, so there are a couple different things you're thinking about once you hit platform. But the other thing you're doing too, and probably the first thing you should do is you're saying you've got a good tone, a good R, which means that you, uh, your rat out works and you're seeing that R in your HUD telling you you got a uh, rat out uh, and you, uh, you arrest your rate of descent. Now you're only coming down at 2,500 feet per minute. You brought the speed brakes in and you're looking for that 10 mile wicket where you're going to dirty up, which means put your gear and your flaps down and start slowing down to 150 knots. Now, real quick on fuel. So if you're too heavy, we have the ability to dump it. Now, if you're carrying too much ordnance, generally we don't do this, but you could jettison it. But what if I'm too low on fuel and I realize that at 10 miles? Can I just pull up to the tanker? So if you're too low on fuel at 10 miles, you have a couple of options. It depends on what kind of operations you're doing. If you're blue water ops, yeah, you have no choice but to go to the tanker. So that'll be option number one. If you are doing something like carrier qualifications or you're just doing divert ops because you didn't, you couldn't do tanker ops for whatever reason, uh, now you need to look at your bingo numbers. And... Um, I, uh, I heard this. This was a great one on NPR. The daughter of a naval aviator called into this show on NPR, where, away with words, I think. She asked, where did they come up with the word bingo for something that seems like a bad connotation? Like, you're bingo. You need to, you ha- you're low on fuel. You need to go assume a certain profile to get yourself on deck as soon as possible before you run out of gas. Well, um, it was really funny to listen to them talk about it. The thing that they were missing was the morbid sense of humor that pilots have and why we probably <laughs> chose bingo. But they said it's because your numbers come up. And I was like, yeah, that's that's darn right. Your numbers come up when you hit bingo fuel right. and you need to adhere to a very strict uh, climb profile and then pull back on the throttle and then uh, essentially assume as good a cl- as close to a glide as you can in a jet plane. Right. So you're trying to be as efficient as possible. So you have options to go to a divert. But I think what you need to tell the listener here, and I'll just tell them for you, is if I get to 10 miles and suddenly tell the world that, oh, sorry, I'm really low on fuel. I'm probably going to get a talking to. You'll definitely get a talking to, but if they didn't know that you were low on fuel from the five other times that you told them your right. state on the way down, then you actually might have a fuel issue. Oh, you know, too. all of a sudden, you sure. know, you're like, well, wait a second, I'm leaking fuel. Or maybe you realize you left your dumps on. Ooh, That's not a good thing. Yeah, that's either. never good. So, okay. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, being low on fuel it, it ain't a good thing. And if uh, if you don't have enough to make the pass, they're going to send you to the tanker. Okay. Or the if it's just enough for one, then they'll t- the tanker will hawk you, as we talked about in episode four, I believe it was. All right. So you get to 10 miles, you slow down your speed of descent, if you will, the, the rate that you're heading towards the water, always good for self-preservation. Yeah, right. And like you said, at 10 miles from the ship now, you're starting to configure for landing. Yeah, certainly. So now you're at uh, uh, 1,200 feet or Angels 1.2, and uh, you have put your gear and your flaps down. You're getting slowed down to 150 knots. And you're now uh, looking to make sure that um, one of the two systems, the precision approach systems that the carrier has, is working. And ideally, you'd like them both to be working. And if you could only have one, you'd rather have ACLS which uh, stands for Automated Carrier Landing System. Um, The other one is ICLS, and it stands for Instrument Carrier Landing System. Now, the difference between them is automated is a two-way communication with the ship. So you actually get more precise information on ACLS. It accounts for things like the movement of the ship, the movement of your aircraft, the winds, pitching deck, if the deck is moving up and down a lot, that'll affect the glide slope reading you're getting. So everybody wants uh, ACLS, which we call needles. Um, and if you have to fly ICLS or what we call bullseye, well, then you got to fly that. And so what will happen typically at eight miles is uh, your controller, you're still being monitored by approach. Um, and you checked in with approach, uh, you know, a few miles before, actually uh, shortly after you commenced. And they're going to come up and tell you, uh, 102, hold you at eight miles, ACLS lock on, say your needles. And we'll say something like, up and on. And it probably better be up and on, not up and right or up or left, because that means you're not on center line. Because that's uh, the one thing you can control out there. That's the one thing you control out there is being on center line. And how do I know as the pilot if I have ACLS? What am I seeing in my heads-up display? Boy, you're making me reach back here, but you should should see like a little circle. There should be an A. Uh, It should say ACLS. It's been a long time since I looked at that HUD. Right. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a there's circle, definitely. right? You put the circle on the... That's right. You put the circle on, on the, the velocity vector. On the velocity vector. That's and right. And it fits That's perfectly it inside. And as yes. long as those two are coincident, you're good. But the ICLS, again, if anyone flies civilian, is a lot like just regular old ILS, right? It you is. just get those two yes. lines that intersect. Okay. Yes. And if you were in the S3, they looked just the same. It was just... Oh, wow. They, they looked... They, yeah, because we didn't have a HUD in the S3, so it was just uh, regular ILS needles. It was just that the ACLS needles were solid. And okay. Okay. ICLS would move around a lot. Oh, all right. Yeah, so anyway, so you, you give them the up and on, and uh, that tells them that ACLS is working, um, and they'll verify that too. One of the other things you got to do is verify altitude because um, you should be at 1,200 feet, and it has happened 
where they have locked on two different aircraft. And so they were giving ACLS information, bad ACLS information to one of the aircraft and telling them that they were higher than they really were. So, so they locked on the aircraft behind them and they're receiving the information. The aircraft that's lower up front is receiving the information. Um, that's a bad day when your instruments are telling you that you're high and you're really low. Yikes. So you got to verify it. You're always checking your, so when you, when, when you hit, um, five miles, you're going to slow to on speed. When you hit three miles, that's when you're going to tip over and you're going to start this descent, you're capturing this three and a half degree glide slope. Um, so you gotta, you've got to back up your numbers. Uh, when you're at three miles, you should be at 1,200 feet. When you're at two miles, you should be at 800 feet. Um, and when you're at one mile, mile, you should be at 400 feet. And of course, you're checking these at the half mile too. You're not oh, yeah. just looking every mile because... Well, hold on. But you know, this whole time, I'm setting you up here. Yeah. Uh, can I just get a sense of how high I am by looking outside at cultural lighting and <laughs> other sources of light? <laughs> you can uh, you can get a sense of what a well digger's rear end looks like by looking outside. That's, That's exactly about it. the expression it I was about to use, by the way. Very good. Great minds think alike. Uh, dark, I think, is an understatement. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it might be that the only source of light is the carrier, If especially if it's overcast or even if it's clear, you might have some stars, but if there's no moon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and the overcast is even worse than nothing. You, uh, even if there's no moon, you get some illumination from stars. And true. stars also tell you up from down. That's true. Um, if you're under overcast, you have no idea what up and down because is. Because the horizon is blurred. So yeah. that one source of light out at 8 or 10 miles, you could be looking at it right side up or upside down. It really wouldn't look that different. It would not. No. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. It's, it's tough. <laughs> it, there's it just some, comes with the territory. It, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So let's say you're at two miles now. You've been marking your altitude. At some point here, and again, we're not going to talk too much about the radios, but the LSOs are out there, and they're bringing each guy individually aboard, and they'll switch back and forth frequencies because we need to be able to share between the two relatively closely spaced aircraft. But at some point now, they're starting to look at you. Maybe the guy ahead of you has landed, so you're kind of the next one up. So you've got all your lights on, of course, because it's nighttime. And now as we get down to about, what, a mile or so is when it starts getting interesting? Yeah, certainly. Um, and and uh, it was really funny. You... you uh you brought back a memory when you said all your lights are on because yeah, all of your lights should be on. And should I have wave be. guys who, you know, it, it, it happens all the time not all the time, but it happens and enough that you see it once in a while. And I did it once too. I had my dang lights off. I just, it's a little pinky switch on the throttle right? and it's really easy to bump it. If you're not paying attention or you just, maybe you're behind the aircraft a little bit and you just, bump that thing. It's really so easy to, to accidentally forget to turn it back on after you went by a cruise ship <laughs> at a thousand feet with full afterburner, <laughs> making all the guests think there's a UFO. And then you go to Marshall and you forget, but I don't know who would have done such a thing. I don't know either, Jill. Yeah. We won't go investigating either. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> and a thousand feet <clears throat> so, might yeah. be generous, but anyway. <laughs> oh gosh. The fun days. Yeah. The good um, old days. So anyway, yes. So your lights should be on. Paddles really appreciate it when your lights are on. They can actually see you. For sure. So I, I mentioned before, you want that two-minute separation in between aircraft. Uh, during the daytime, uh, they target 45 seconds in between landings. And at nighttime, they have to give you more separation because obviously you need to use half the speed at night. you got to slow down. So an aircraft lands, they take a little bit more time to let them get out of the wires. You've got to move a little bit slower, taxiing around on the flight deck, that sort of thing. And it takes, the LSOs also need more time with what they're doing on the platform because it's not just dark out there in the aircraft. It's also very dark on the flight deck. They turn all the lights off on the flight deck and just leave the lights on that the pilots need to be able to see the aircraft carrier. So half the speed, twice the caution. So, uh, you know, you're coming down. Hopefully the guy in front of you has uh, made their trap. You've got that nice two minute spacing. And then, um, and then you're, just flying, you're just flying your approach from there. It's only about another minute a minute and a half once you've done that and before you call the ball. So uh, if you don't see the carrier at three quarters of a mile and you're between 250 and 300 feet, then um, things start to get, things start to feel a little funny. Um, I never had that situation. I, I, I think the, the worst I ever got was I broke out at three, three quarters of a mile. But um, the deployment before mine in, the S, in my S3 squadron. So this was not, this was not night um, case three. This was day case three. And they were flying OIF. And they were the only aircraft carrier, not just the only aircraft carrier in Air Wing, but they were the only aviation assets that decided to fly that day in a sandstorm to support the troops on the ground. And they did it, and they came back, and the visibility was what we call zero-zero. 
and uh, everybody made it back aboard. And that's a big tribute to the pilots and to paddles. For sure. Getting them aboard. But um, one of the big plays I heard to make the deck was the Nugget in the squadron. He was an S3. This is an S3 squadron. So very forgiving aircraft to land at the boat, but we didn't have a heads up display. And he was uh, very high and very right when he broke out on the plat cam, pretty much over the, the round down, right at the back of the ship. And a uh, big right for lineup and probably stomped on the DLC, which is uh, uh, something we had to spoil lift. And uh, he got aboard. I mean, and so he, he was that, right. So he had to come left or he, he was right. Yeah. Okay, he was so lined up right. So gotcha. he had to come left yeah, and aggressive come left, like at the last second. And he was high as a kite too, but got brought aboard. it aboard. So wow, anyway, um, hopefully you don't find yourself in that position when you're at three quarters of a mile and you're calling Clara. When you say Clara, that means you don't see the meatball. And um, there's another term you can use, which is Clara ship, which means you don't even see the ship. Uh, one's, one's a bad day. The other's a terrible day. Yeah. So hopefully at three quarters of a mile, you see the ball and you go ahead and you make your ball call. And so it'd be, you know, 102 Rhino ball 5.0. And paddles will come back and they should tell you Roger ball. And hopefully that's the last thing that uh, Paddle says to you. That's right. And sometimes they'll throw in the wind, right? Sometimes they'll throw in the wind. So yeah. sometimes they'll tell you you got a you got a slight starboard wind or you got six knots, but normally they'll try to squeeze that in in between passes, so so the okay. pilots know. And then it's just uh, it's uh, it's actually a little bit further. It seems like at night or uh, or a little bit longer, but it's about twenty seconds of intense concentration, going meatball lineup angle of attack. Same um, thing as we talked about on the previous episodes, except now it's dark. And you're trying to make sense out of the lights, which, oh, by the way, could be changing if the ship is moving, not moving through the water, but up and down with swells. Oh, excellent. So now we get into pitching deck. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. And uh, and pitching deck is one thing during the daytime. At night, it just is is just not fun. And you get you get a lot of pitching deck in the South Pacific, over by Australia. The carriers do fine in choppy seas when there are swells and there's lo- a lot of longitude in between those waves. Now the carrier really starts to move, and we got a lot of that. And so you'll you'll see a whole lot of flight deck at one minute, which means you see a lot of lights, and then you see a lot fewer lights all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, and the the lens can keep up with about plus or minus three feet of movement, but when you start hitting plus or minus six, seven, eight, the lens isn't keeping up. Right. And so um, so now you're getting bad information from the meatball, and this is about the time the paddles are going to start talking to you too. What Paddles is looking for, one, is that you're keeping a good a good state on the jet. You're not getting slow. He knows if you're slow or not by an AOA indexer, we call it, that, that is in the nose gear. And that is colored. If he sees an amber color, he knows you're on speed. On speed is the optimal attitude of the jet to land and catch right. a wire. If you see a red, that means you're fast. So, you don't, so you're actually flatter, you're shallower. Mm-hmm. Correspondingly in the aircraft, you're actually seeing a faster indicated airspeed. And then what Paddles absolutely does not want to see is a green. And so if he sees that green light, you're slow. And if it's pitching deck and there's no horizon, he's really pissed off at yeah. you, actually. He's going to give bad. you a really angry power call. <laughs> oh, I've um, <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> Probably from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure it was well earned. Now, in the daytime... You don't use these lights, right? You just kind of look at the whole airplane. Exactly. During the daytime, we can judge the attitude. You have the lights to reference as well, but at night, that's all you got. Pretty much those lights and then some other position lights and formation lights and yeah, strobes. Yeah, and so. absolutely. Okay. And so, yeah, so now I, uh, we, we've done a very graceful transition from being in the cockpit to now I'm standing on the platform and I'm looking out at the aircraft and I'm trying to determine, is this guy, is he flying a safe enough flight path and jet attitude to come aboard? And at night, it's even trickier because you don't have a horizon. Now, if you're lucky, and oftentimes you did, you had a plane guard out there. Now, the plane guard was a small boy, so a destroyer or a cruiser that was attached to the battle group. And if they, they would have their mast lights on, but their job was to be 2,000 yards behind the ship in case an aircraft went in the water. Pilot had to eject because they would be there available to help in the recovery. So if you had a plane guard back there, then you could use that as a horizon, and that would help you out a little bit. If, uh, if you didn't, it really, you really had to rely on experience. There was a lot of experience that came to play there, especially if there, was, there were some nights, especially in the Persian Gulf, where there was no horizon. Um, where you might get lucky is if you had some oil fires out there. <laughs> so there's oil platforms. But the ship that's following us can provide a reference so that you can hopefully maybe see trends, right? Because if you're just yes. looking at this 
light source. It could be climbing or descending. And of course, once you've done it a lot, then you probably get a sixth sense about it. But otherwise, it's very, very difficult to judge, is this person coming down too quickly? or Because being too high is also dangerous, not just too low. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I was uh, what scared me more was guys that were too high because you know they're pulling the power back. They're trying to get back on glide slope. And so they'll start pulling the throttle back. And the last thing that you want is a guy coming into the burble. The burble, if, uh, if you recall from the last episode, if they went into it, is because of the way the wind moves over the aircraft carrier, it actually dips down, the, right. which causes a little suck hole. And that's about, you know, a couple hundred feet behind the boat, um, out to about a quarter of a mile. And what happens is that wind then bounces off the water and then comes up and creates a rooster tail. So what happens to the aircraft is it feels a, you feel a little bit of a lift and you have to pull the power back because this wind is pushing you up. But then right after that, you're going to go into the burble and you're going to get sucked down. So you have to keep power on the jet. Well, if you have a guy that's high and he's really high, he's pulling power off of his jet and he's probably in the rooster tail at that point and he's getting ready to hit the burble and he's going to come down like a ton of stuff, um, which happened to a buddy of mine, an S3 guy uh, who uh, had transitioned to Hornets. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Wells Green Shrimp. He got high in the Hornet. And um, he pulled the power back, and it was pitching deck. And uh, next thing he knew, he, did, he didn't see it coming, paddles and screaming, power, power, wave off. Um, he slammed into had a ramp strike. Um, collapsed the left main gear, smashed one of the engines, just, uh, just fire coming out the back of his aircraft. Of course, he just went, didn't catch any wires or anything. He was just going sliding off the, off the angle. And uh, he punched out just in time. Um, luckily, his, his jet was, was canted to the left because he collapsed the left main gear. And so when he punched out, he went to the left because he had gone below the flight deck when, uh, when he actually ended up when the, when the rockets fired. And so since he was tilted to the left, he was tilted away from the aircraft carrier. Damn. Versus if he had been tilted to the right, if he had collapsed the right main, it might have been a different story. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that was one of those black nights pitching deck and uh, and that yeah. was that was a result so part of the danger of the burble that we're talking about here in this night landing episode is that you don't have the peripheral vision i mean it's already a risk in the daytime but in the daytime mm-hmm. you have i'll call it an advantage of at least the ocean hopefully and a little bit of the ship and some other things out there but at night i mean it's really difficult to tell what's what and your brain i don't know about yours mine used to play tricks with me especially the pitching deck stuff you were just talking about um Dude, and you weren't kidding. The, the, off the coast of Australia, in 2005, I was on Nimitz, and that's when the PBS crew came out with us and did the eight-part series or whatever. Uh-huh. And we had plus or minus 20-foot swells. God, I mean, geez. from where the ship is normally, it would go down 20, back to normal, and up 20. <sighs> and at four miles, what should be a trapezoid, essentially, of lights, right? Because it's a little fatter and mm-hmm. closer to you and a little narrower. It was like pulsating. It looked like an hourglass. And I could not make sense <laughs> out of it. It's the scariest... <laughs> landings I've ever had. And the first time down, I didn't even touch the ship. Oh I got out of cycle and went around. The second time, I touched the ship, but beyond the wires. And the third time around, by the grace of God and paddles, I think I grabbed the four on the fly, and partly because I just reefed back on the stick to do a quick AOA excursion <laughs> and drop the hook. <laughs> and I got aboard, and I'll tell you, and this could be a good segue into Danger TV, but I, I landed, I taxied clear. My legs were shaking like crazy because all the adrenaline oh, yeah. was all just there, but not bothering me yet. I was, you mm-hmm. know, I was fearful, but I was keeping my composure. But there was so much adrenaline going through my legs at that point, almost made it difficult to taxi the airplane because you taxi with your feet in the mm-hmm. brakes. And it took us forever to get everybody aboard that night. Oh, um, I can't imagine. But it, it was awful. I can't and so, imagine. yeah, I walk yeah. into the ray room, everybody claps, and here comes the PBS guys throwing the camera in my face. Hey, how was that? <laughs> yeah, was it? Like, yeah. I just... Leave me alone. You know, I'm glad to be alive. Um, oh, man. But I want to go back to what you were talking about with the lens not keeping up. What system do we have for when that happens? Because if the lens isn't providing good information, we need to give good information to the pilots. Yeah, certainly. Um, we, we call it the green machine. And Farva mentioned in the episode before that we, we grade our passes. Um, and the, you know, the OK pass, you, you'll put that up on your... Uh, up on the board in the ready room, and that'll be a green tile. Well, the general rule with Movelis is as long as you listen to paddles, which means do what paddles told you to do on Movelis, you're going to get an okay. So everybody loved the the green machine because it boosted your grades. But Movelis was easy in theory, but what you have to remember is you're no longer flying. The, The ball is no longer showing you a glide slope. It is paddles actually communicating to you through light, telling you to add power 
or to pull power. Okay, so hold on. Let's go back. So Movelis, I believe, is, correct me if I'm wrong, manually operated visual landing aid system? Yes, that's wow, exactly it. There you go, okay. right? <laughs> so now I've got a fake ball where, unlike what Farver was saying, was you only see a certain lens uh, illuminate when you're at a certain spot in the sky. Now you, Paddles, when I'm coming aboard, can tell me, okay, here comes Jello, and here's what I want him to do. So I'm going to show him this. Yes. And I could be dragging along my main wheels in the water, and you could show me high. Exactly. Okay. And so, and so um, the... Not to say you would do that, n- but just I mean, to make the point. You're right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> would not do that. <laughs> But um, w- the way Paddles does it is we have, uh, we have a handle that he just raises up and raises down. And so at some point, there's a detent where it's the middle. And then it can, you can raise it all the way to the top to show them you know, a full high, um, that they're high. Really, what you're telling them is, I want you to pull power. Or you can drop it all the way to the bottom, and you can show them. Uh, and it, it's even, it even has a red ball at the bottom um, to show them that you want, want them to um, add power. So you've got, your, you've got the mobile stick in one hand, and you've got your phone in the other hand, your radio phone up to your ear and your uh, you may or may not be talking to the pilot as well but you will basically what you're trying to do on Movilis is bring the pilot across the ramp Farva said you know if you're flying the ball and trying to land on three wire you want about 14 feet of clearance typically paddles would go for 10 feet of clearance when flying Movilis because what they're trying to actually do is get you into a shallower more powered up state as you're crossing the ramp. So what we don't want is to have you high as a kite when you get to the burble. And so that's what, what Paddles is trying to, to avoid. So we'll, we'll typically have you bring it down a little bit by showing you a high ball. So you pull a little bit of power. And then as you're going through that burble, we're getting you that and showing you that low ball. So you're coming on with the power a little bit and we'll bring you in a little bit shallower glide slope into, and typically there we're, you know, we're trying to get the two wire. We want to get you down a little bit sooner when we're flying Movelis. A safe recovery. But a safe recovery. If you're doing that, you've got to have some coordination because you're showing me something. You're also talking to me. you got your phone. But what am I doing as the pilot? Do I fly it any different if I know it's Movelis? Exactly. So they, they tell you, don't fly it any differently. You're supposed to fly it just like it's the ball. So if sure. you see a high ball, you're supposed to pull some power. If you see a low ball, you're supposed to add power. But it, it, it definitely does help to know that it's Movelis. Actually, maybe it doesn't. I think one day, I think one day, actually, I had no idea it was Movilis, and I just flew it like it was a regular ball, and it was the smoothest pass I ever flew. It was like... (laughs) But they will typically say something, they being paddles, because for the F-18 Hornet, we had to be at a lower fuel weight, or total weight, I should say, Mm -hmm. which is usually fuel. And then for everybody else, it just makes you know that, okay, you can't just afford to gun deck this thing. Not that we do anyway, but just it's just more information. And information is usually power. All right, so real quick, though, going back to ACLS, because that is a two-way system, System, that gives us the capability to actually do an auto land as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. So what do I do there? I just there's some buttons I push. Not important to say which, but there's buttons I can push that couple the flight yep. controls to the ACLS, and then I can also push an auto throttles. And at that point, I can land hands off. Yeah, certainly. Uh, we call that mode one. So if you fly a mode one approach, um, that means that. The, uh, the computers are flying it for you. So the ship's computer is talking to your aircraft computer. Uh, like you said, you just have to push a couple buttons, engage a couple autopilots. And, uh, well, you could put your – no, you wouldn't put your hands on the towel racks, no. uh, the little handlebars up on the canopy. No. That's, no you wouldn't yeah. do that. I never did one, but I, I understand people would usually hawk the controls. You would hawk there. the controls. You would, yeah. you'd, be, you'd have your hands right over the throttle and the, uh, and the stick ready to click out um, in a heartbeat. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, uh, mode one, I only saw a couple of those from the platform. I uh, never did one myself either. The ones that I saw, uh, the system worked pretty great. I was like, yeah, hey, good on you. Hey. All right, dude, I know we could talk about this forever. Unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time from the spaces that we're using here, which I'm sure the listener doesn't care about, but we've got other people <laughs> wanting to use this room. <laughs> but effectively, we've talked about just how dark it is, how difficult it is. And of course, if you bolter, we talked about the pattern for the daytime, but at nighttime you do something slightly different, but they'll direct you back around and you'll get Mm -hmm. another chance at it, or if you wave off for that matter. Right. Uh, And then when you land, you go shut down. And we talked a little bit about that. Uh, Gosh, what else? I mean, again, there's obviously a lot to this, but what else is there? Well, you know, so uh, since we're short on time, we'll just talk about from the inside of the ready room. When you're in the ready room and you're watching night recoveries, it isn't just like, you know, some kind of sadomasochistic thing, although it may be too. It's that you're interested on how your buddies are doing and how the recovery is going because the squadron duty officer needs to keep track of that kind of stuff. And you need to know what the state of the aircraft is and, and the state of recoveries. So we would watch people recover on 
on TV. We called it Danger TV. So um, in the ready room, it was quite an experience. It was uh, one of the things I'll, I'll also never forget about flying at night was um, watching my buddies come down the chute, too, and try to get aboard. And, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, nervous for them. Yeah, because you want them to do well, but if they do something silly or, you know, what, not silly, but if they do something dumb, it's kind of fun to laugh. But it, in the end, we're all rooting for each other to do well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You just want everybody to get aboard, and uh, you feel bad for a guy when he has a night in the barrel, yeah. which means he goes around several times before oh, he yeah. can actually get that trap. And I've been there before, too, and I think everybody has. I have, too, and I've shared it already on a previous episode. So, But everybody's happy when they get aboard and we go to Midrats and get cheeseburgers. There you go. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Well, dude, what's the future hold for you? Well, so I'm getting my MBA now. I've got about two years left in the Navy. Um, I, I would like to fly for the airlines and start my own business, which I understand the airlines afford you the time to be able to start your own business or to run your own podcast, which is pretty great. Um, <laughs> for sure. So, so that's my goal. Excellent. Well, uh, speaking of that, thank you for coming on yeah. the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Fish. But uh, we can't let you go okay. until you explain your call signs. So. Yeah, it's a it's a terrible story. Everybody has like a, a good story, I'm sure. Uh, most most call signs have terrible stories. I was in Fallon. We had our new battle group commander, so the one star admiral there, and I'm with all the department heads. And I don't know, people are telling jokes, so I tell a joke that was. A terrible joke. Everybody just kind of looked at me, and uh, one of the department heads said, uh, the movie Finding Nemo had just come out. He goes, hey, you're Clownfish. Tell us a joke. And uh, so they started calling me Clownfish. And so as I got the opportunity, I just went into the clown off, and I just started going by fish, and it seemed to fly. So <laughs> I'm just fish. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's at least, you know what? We don't get too many guys on the show. It's because of something they did. A lot of them are their names. So that's, that's a great story. All right, Fish. Well, thanks for coming on here and giving us a very quick summary of the scariest thing any aviator or apparently astronaut does. And I want to wish you all the best in your last couple of years in the Navy and your transition to the airlines. And unless you got any parting shots, I think we'll wrap it up and get out of here. I do not. Thank you for having me on, Jello. It was a great trip down memory lane. Okay. Outstanding. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. And my thanks once again to Fish for coming on the show and sharing his expertise. It's been a few years since either one of us have done it, but it sticks with you the rest of your life, I can tell you, just like Pete Conrad said. Anyway, I just want to amplify a few things we talked about. First, when he said to dirty up, of course, we mean configure for landing. And that, he had said, was at 10 miles generally from the back of the ship. And I believe the standard now is about eight nautical miles. And the one thing we talked about there was with the gear and the flaps is we never said anything about the arresting hook. And that was understood by us, but not mentioned, that it was already down once we check in with Marshall. That's just something you do right then and there. And that way you don't forget to put your hook down. Also, with the uh, lights thing, and I really did do that, by the way, so I hope nobody important is listening who's going to come bust me for it, but hopefully the people on the ship thought it was funny. Anyway, if you leave your lights off, you still have your AOA indexers, and they will still show you whether you're on speed or fast or slow, like he talked about. So even if you come down with nothing else on, you get that one source of light, and usually by then, paddles won't tell you to turn everything else on because they don't want you to think about it. They'll just wave you off if they can't see you well enough, or they'll bring you aboard and probably downgrade your landing for being an idiot and leaving your lights off like I did. And then when he talked about up and on, what he means there is as you're flying in at 1,200 feet and you're waiting to intercept the glide slope, at three miles is where you do it. So what happens is the if you were to be on glide slope at, say, five or six miles, well, you'd have to be much higher than 1,200 feet. So if you are on the right azimuth, but you're just waiting to catch up with the glide slope as it comes down to meet you at about three miles, then up is where I would fly. I would go up to get on the glide slope, and on means I am on laterally. So up and on, or some people will say fly up, fly on, or fly right, fly on. And again, if, if you are admitting to everybody you need to go to the right, well, you should have done that already. And it's just kind of a mark on your aviationmanship, whatever the right word would be for that. All right. Well, that is the end of this carrier series. I hope you enjoyed it. There are a couple hanging chads, though. Number one is we did not talk about the barricade and we didn't talk about the magic carpet. So I've got a couple fighter pilot 
networks. I am looking for someone who has taken a barricade. There's at least two F-18 guys, one Navy, one Marine, recently. Well, in the last 10 or 15 years. And then there's probably a bunch of older folks on the uh, Facebook page I'm a part of. So I'm going to see if I can find someone to come talk about the barricade itself and their experience taking one. So that may be a while. It certainly won't be the next episode, I can tell you that. And then the magic carpet thing that we've alluded to on a couple of Facebook Live sessions and elsewhere. I need to get someone on to talk about how that works too because I'm just not aware. All right, well, that will then do it, like I said, for the Carrier Series and for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. And thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can also find us on all the expected social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you'd like to gain access to exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and material, and in the process help support this show, Well, again, visit that Patreon page and join all the other patrons who are trying to get us to a goal so we can start doing four episodes a month instead of just the normal three. Please like, follow, share us with your network, and if you have a chance to leave us a rating or review on iTunes or anywhere else ratings and reviews are supported, we would greatly appreciate it. So again, that will do it for this week. It's been a pleasure having you as my wingman on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Until next time, you take it easy. See ya. Oodle loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. <sighs>